Do we need to redesign society from scratch? Much of the big fix that we find ourselves in today dates back to 1971. When U.S. production of oil peaked, right after that, of course, imports skyrocketed, and the trade deficit began expanding. The dollar, which had been backed by gold, was totally destabilized as the U.S. hemorrhaged gold. So Nixon had a very important decision to make. He had to decide what to back the dollar on. He met with King Faisal at the, at the White House, and in that meeting, what transpired would set in motion the economic crisis that we see today. You see, three months after that meeting, Nixon took the dollar off the international gold standard, and he put it onto oil, essentially floating the U.S. economy on the value of oil. This then fixed the U.S. economy to oil for the foreseeable future. So fast forward two years. That system fails as Syria and Egypt attack Israel. The United States sides with Israel. We're punished in the Arab oil embargo. And so what's the U.S. response to this? Very simple. We look at the Middle East. We look at where the major oil fields are. And essentially, we begin a permanent military occupation of the Middle East. Now, to really understand why these events take place, we have to kind of pull back a little bit, take a 50,000-foot view. Humanity is at the confluence of three major pressures. Those pressures are pushing us into some very uncomfortable and nasty places. Now, if we look at them one by one, we see that we're probably beyond peak oil, but we're probably beyond the peaks of most major terrestrial resources, meaning that world demand far exceeds supply for the modern things that we need to live. If we look one more thing, what's not declining? Sex. <laughs> I take it from the laughter, you all like sex. But that's pushing our world population to grow at a staggering rate, which is having effects around the world. It's changing sea ice, melting it, changing the salinity of our ocean, which changes the amount of heat that moves to Europe, which is why Europe had the coldest winter in recorded history this year. You see, the feedback loops that we associate with climate change aren't going to happen someday. They're happening right now. So if we add to the system that we have in place our energy systems, which are old, they're designed on a very simple principle, extract, consume, and destroy. We start to see things in a new context like natural gas. Very simple. We extract it from the earth through fracking. It destroys our water table. Oil drilling, deep shore drilling. We're about to open 68 million acres in the Arctic to offshore drilling with no new cleanup technologies, none whatsoever. Coal. There is no known... Oops, skipped forward one. Let's go back one. Coal, there's no known sequestration technology that actually functions. So what we're going to do is use the CO2 in coal to extract more oil out of oil wells. That's bad behavior enabling more bad behavior. And then we talk about tar sands. We're preparing to build a pipeline from Canada's tar sands all the way down to Louisiana and Texas. This will go over the major freshwater aquifer in the United States where we get the majority of our farming and drinking water. The oil industry will tell you there will be no spills, <laughs> like there was in the Yellowstone River last week. They'll tell you it's not going to contaminate your water supply. But this is mission critical, because it allows the refineries in the Gulf Coast, where I'm from, to continue to produce our oil and gasoline, our diesel and our jet fuel. The machine has to feed itself. So if we take the dynamic pressures, that we see. Oh, and then there's nuclear. If we have TED Talk nuke proponents, Stuart Brand and Bill Gates, great minds, but I disagree with their logic around nuclear. Look at Fukushima. When Fukushima happened, we all saw this picture on the internet. We thought, that can't be true. That has no validity. Then the EPA's monitoring website that relates to their radiation monitoring in California registers a steep and steady incline in radiation in California. Then, that web page goes away. Why? 
Short-term effects of Fukushima are very obvious. We have irradiated human beings, irradiated animals, irradiated food supply. The plutonium and cesium gushed into the Pacific River, into the Pacific Ocean. We will be eating that in our sushi soon. The nuclear industry tells us that these events are, these catastrophic events only happen once in 35,000 years. But we see that the majority of the nuclear facilities on the Earth are built on or near a fault line. We've had three of these events in 35 years. So the big question with nuclear, as with all of these technologies, is are we ready for more Fukushimas? If we take this confluence, we start to see a pattern. We must be ready for more Fukushimas because four months later in Nebraska, this nuclear power facility is surrounded by flood water. Each of these contain the irradiated waste. They are ready and waiting to burn. They are like dirty bombs waiting to happen. So this is the pattern we've established. And if you pull back and look again, what is the pattern? How does it relate to how we live? The three dynamic pressures pushing on humanity, an antiquated energy system, we see that we're in an intractable trap, a self-perpetuating, self-destructive cycle, which looks like there's no way out. Well, what does our future hold? What does it hold? Jared Diamond talks about collapse. He says the four major criteria for a society that will likely collapse we destroy our resource base, climate change occurs, we have untenable relationships with the nations that we depend on, and there are social factors which inhibit us from seeing and solving our problems. So what are the social factors that we see today? What's clouding our vision? Well, just a few, recession, bank bailouts, austerity, rising unemployment in the United States, rising unemployment in Europe. We see desertification, the collapse of the fiat system, conflicts over water, and finally, conflict in the Middle East over oil continuously. And then if we pull back and we see what's going underneath that, we see that all the commodity prices that we all need are rising, which results in worldwide protest. And that's clouding our vision as to what's really happening. So, once again, why? Why did we build a system that was self-destructive? Why did we build a society that was completely bent on destroying itself? And the answer is very simple. We designed it on an old model that's based on centralized control, centralized power, domination, extraction, competition, which leaves the majority of humanity in debt slavery or some form of indentured servitude. There is a name for this. It's called an empire, and it's maintained by an oligarchy. But it doesn't have to be that way, and we're seeing that it's shifting. Around the world, we're seeing a new model emerge, and that new model is based on distributed control, distributed power, stewardship, cyclical sy systems, collaboration, and the democratic community of communities. And what's important about this is this is an epistemological shift from a society that's parasitic to one that is symbiotic. And when you look at what that means, that for us is a fundamental shift in philosophy, thinking, design, and human interaction. It is not a shift given by technology. It is a shift that will give us new technologies, but the fundamentals of the shift are in philosophy. The great thinker, Michel Foucault, called this a new episteme. And he wasn't the only one. A hundred years ago, Rudolf Steiner saw this system. He, he said, it will be a biodynamic system in which human beings integrate into nature. Bucky Fuller said, it'll be a whole system. We'll be participants in it. We are the crew on Spaceship Earth, he said. We see this in our cities, this interplay between the old model and the new model. We're talking about San Francisco just a minute ago. And here we are just south of Los Angeles. So if you look at San Francisco, San Francisco's got 107 miles of rail line, 46 train stations. Los Angeles destroyed its public transportation system to make room for cars. We think that bigger freeways are better, but we know that bigger freeways equal more cars, which equal bigger freeways, which is why San Francisco has trains and we have Carmageddon. <laughs>
So we see signs of hope. We see great signs of hope everywhere. Across the Midwest, biorefineries are popping up. That's a bulk of the 2.7 million new green jobs in the United States are coming out of the Midwest. Midwest is growing, not shrinking. Farmers markets in our cities, we're seeing alternative currencies appear. I love alternative currencies, that's very powerful. We see the green, re green roofs industry is literally sprouting up. It's a $1 billion a year industry today. And there are a lot of things that you could do. You could garden, you could join a CSA, join a transition town group, <laughs> kill your TV, yeah. watch TED instead. You take your money out of the Wall Street casino, put it in the credit union, drive biodiesel, E85, alcohol, electric, walk, ride, jump, run, investigate solar and wind rebates for your home, dig beneath the headlines, verify. And you could do as Thomas Jefferson did. You could question the authority of the system that has been designed. You could do as our forefathers designed the Declaration of Independence to do. You could create revolution. So in closing, remember, you're not alone. This is the beginning of a new epoch, a new time of philosophy, design, thinking, change for human civilization. Every species that has not gone extinct has learned to adapt. So let us, the human race, begin to learn to adapt. And remember, redesigning society from scratch, that's an inevitability. The big question is, will we do it as a result of collapse, or will we do it by choice? Thank you.